All right, grab your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 13, or you can read on the screen with us. By the way, this is sermon number 20 of the series that we have been doing, What in Heaven is Going On? Doesn't seem possible that we've done 20 of these. Revelation chapter 13, starting at verse 11. Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth. Now say all. How much is all? All is all, right? He required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone, say anyone, anyone refusing to worship it must die. He required everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or in the forehead, and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six. Six, six. Many years ago in Scotland, it wasn't, it wasn't this stool, Dan. But many years ago in Scotland, someone built a three-legged stool. It was called, anybody know what it was called? It was called a cutty stool. And it became known as the chair of repentance. Now, we would call it the naughty chair. And... What they would do with this naughty chair, Christine, not saying you, the pastor, if you had broken one of the Ten Commandments, especially number seven, how many of you know what number seven is of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not commit adultery. If you have broken one of the commandments, especially commandment number seven, then the pastor would bring you up during the service and he would set you on the naughty chair. Now, Dan, I don't think that would work today. I kind of like the idea, but I don't think it would work 
in the day and age that which we live. Because, you know, if I were to just pick someone out of the, the congregation and say, hey, you're in the naughty chair this week, you know, I, I doubt that they're coming. But nonetheless, that was what the stool, that three-legged stool was originally used for. It was punishment. But one day, not long from now, the Antichrist is going to reign from a three-legged stool. He will be rebellious, but not repentant. He will be conniving, but not contrite. One leg of his throne is going to be a global government. One leg of his throne is going to be a global currency. And one leg of his throne will be a global religion. So for the purpose of the next three messages that I'm about to preach, I want to do two things. I'm going to give you what the Bible says says is going to happen. And then I'm going to give you what I believe has to happen to make what's going to happen come to pass. Does that make sense? Now, this three-legged stool will not be fully utilized until the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. But you and I all know that the process of globalization has been going on for many, many, many years now. And even though we will escape the tribulation, you and I, we are still going to have to endure the run-up, the build-up, and the lead-in to the great tribulation. When God's wrath is going to be poured out and all these prophetic warnings are going to be fulfilled. Now, a couple weeks ago, while we were all celebrating Valentine's Day and expressing to each other I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. While we're celebrating Valentine's Day, probably few of you know that over in Dubai, there was a summit taking place of 10,000 leaders from around the world. The only king that was not invited was King Jesus. He was excluded. And this annual meeting of world leaders is called the World Government Summit. And I wrote down just a few of the topics. They, they, they broke into small groups, and I wrote down just a few of the topics that they were going to discuss. Number one, regulation for the new global finance. Importance of local or location intelligence. Importance of location intelligence for government and economics. Another topic was effectively market to millennials and Gen Z. Now, let me... All that is is code. It's code for how do we influence the thinking of our young people.
this undercurrent of globalization is absolutely, as I said, nothing new. Matter of fact, it's been ongoing since the fall of man in the garden. Powerful men bent on conquest, wanting to rule the world. And you would like to think that because this country was founded upon biblical principles and the leaders of our nation should know better, you would like to think it wouldn't happen here, right? How many of you remember years ago in a speech given during the Persian Gulf War, President Bush said that this war was about more than one small country. It's about, I'm quoting, it's a big idea, a new world order with new ways of working with other nations, peaceful settlement of disputes, solidarity against aggression, reduced and controlled arsenals, and just treatment of all peoples. Now that sounds benign, right? There are three very powerful organizations that advise our government concerning various policies in this country. They're secretive, they're influential, and they work behind the scenes. Most of you have heard of them. There's the Council on Foreign Relations, there is the Trilateral Commission, and then there are the Bilderbergers. All three of these organizations have stated the same agenda, a one world government. And so I thought I would read just a few things to you this morning. This is memorandum number seven that they have titled, A World Effectively Controlled by the United Nations. This is from the Council on Foreign Relations. A world effectively controlled by the United Nations is one in which, now you got to understand, These are the people that are advising our government. A world effectively controlled by the United Nations is one in which world government would come about through the establishment of a supra, not super, supra national institutions characterized by mandatory universal membership and some ability to employ physical force. Effective control would thus entail a preponderance of political power in the hands of a supranational organization. The present UN Charter would theoretically be revised in order to erect such an organization equal to the task envisioned thereby codifying a radical rearrangement of power in the world. That's memorandum number seven, Council on Foreign Relations. Let me read to you the Bloomberg Memorandum. The fence, uh, the principle, here let me back up. This memorandum was to study how disarmament could be used to usher in world government. Now I'm reading the document. The principal features of a model system would include the following. Power sufficient to monitor to monitor and enforce disarmament, settle disputes and keep the peace, including taxing powers an international police force, which is now openly called the New World Army, balanced appropriately among the ground, sea, air, and space elements consisting of a half a million men recruited individually wearing a UN uniform and controlling a nuclear force composed of 50 to 100 mixed land-based mobile missiles and undersea-based missiles averaging one megaton per weapon. Number three, a government uh, that will be divided among three branches and compulsory jurisdiction of the international court. 
These are the people that are advising our government. The CFR is the American branch of a society which originated in England and believes national boundaries should be obliterated and one world rule established. That was written by a guy by the name of Carol Quigley. And you probably don't know who that is, except you probably know this next guy. He was the personal mentor to Bill Clinton. The main purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is promoting the disarmament of U.S. sovereignty and national independence and to submerge all into an all-powerful one-world government. You know who wrote that? The former, the former Admiral and JAG of the U.S. Navy. Chester Ward. This thing runs from the highest levels of our government. So, what needs to happen? What needs to happen? We know this is going to happen. I read the scripture to you. And how do you know the Bible does not lie? You can trust that thing from Genesis to Revelation. You can live by it. You can die by it. I, I, I talk to people all the time about uh, all the prophecies that have been fulfilled in the word of God. There's only about 10% of them, probably not even 10%, that have not yet happened yet. But let me ask you a question. If 90% of what God said was going to happen, happened, how many of you think that you can trust that the other few percent is going to come to pass? If God said it, it will happen, church. It's going to happen. So we know what's going to happen But what needs to happen to make what's going to happen happen? Well, let me just, let me, can I just make some suggestions here? One of the things that is going to happen or has to happen is let's just say that there was some form of worldwide crisis. Now I'm going to give you about five, six different scenarios here. And do you know all of these scenarios that I'm about to give you were discussed at that world government summit. What about what about what about what if we have a crisis of a war? What if there's a war? And then this nation jumps in, and that nation jumps in, then this nation jumps in, then this nation jumps in. And it looks like there's going to be a world war. And we've got to get all the nations together. Man, we've got to get all the leaders together. We've got to figure this thing out. A war, a war, a, a world war would be a good crisis. It would be a good way to bring everybody together, wouldn't it? Hmm. That's very possible, isn't it? 
What if, let me suggest another crisis that, that, that might do the trick. What if there was a worldwide famine? I looked it up this morning. Statistics, the latest statistics I could find, 821 million people in the world are not getting enough to eat. And this caught my eye some time back when I read this. They said, starvation, worldwide starvation is one failed harvest away. One would plunge the world into starvation. I don't know if you, you, you guys are thinking this way. Remember the four horsemen that, that rode out in the book of Revelation? One failed harvest would bring about worldwide starvation. All the nations of the world, I guarantee you, would be meeting together. How do we solve this crisis? What if there was a worldwide pandemic? Oh, wait, there was one. What if there was a worldwide natural disaster? Maybe something like a meteor strike. A strike that would cause a massive earthquake and then volcanoes would come back to life and the dust from the meteor strike and the dust from the volcano would, would, would blacken the earth and uh, the temperature would drop several degrees and it would become hard to breathe causing all sorts of environmental issues. I don't know if you've been following the news, but they're following a meteor that they say could hit Earth in just a couple of years. I don't know whether it will. I don't know whether it won't. But the point is, that is a crisis. How do we deal with this? What do we do? And by the way, that's Matthew chapter 24, verse Seven, if you want to read it from the Bible. Now, let, let me... What if... Now, don't throw eggs at me here. <laughs> That's good, who said that? That's really good. Too expensive. What if we created a worldwide crisis and we called it climate change? Just suggesting. Just suggesting. What would happen What would happen if millions of people disappeared? Aliens abducted them. Or maybe the rapture happened. I think that would cause a crisis that would bring all the world together. And by the way, we all know the, the globalist motto, right? Never let a good crisis go to waste. So the first thing that has to happen 
to bring about what's going to happen to pass is a crisis. The second thing that I believe that has to happen is, and the Bible says this, nations must surrender their sovereignty. Now, if you are already, if you were living in a socialist country, this is not an issue. Because you don't know if you live in a socialist country, you don't know what freedom is. So it's, it's nothing to you to switch your allegiance. But what if you live in a self-governing country? they might not be so quick to give up their autonomy. Now, this might seem like a big problem, right? Countries that enjoy their freedom, you're going to ask them to give up their freedoms. Kevin, this might not be as big a problem as you think. Because the United States is the glue that holds all of it together. And if the United States were to fall, then everyone comes right in line. You understand what I'm saying? This is not as difficult. This is not as difficult as it seems. So... I, I got to thinking about this. How would you go about, let's just say you were the Antichrist, let's just say you were the devil. How would you go about getting a nation to surrender its sovereignty? How would you go about getting people to give up their freedoms? Well, can I just offer some suggestions here? Seeing how the, the United States is the glue that holds it all together and seeing how this country was founded upon the worship of God and biblical principles, we would have to eliminate God and those biblical values from society. That's the first thing that would have to happen. We would have to get God out of the equation. And since our Constitution was based on those biblical values, we would need to change the Constitution or at the very least redefine it. Wait, 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 just a second. If we were going to get a nation to give up its sovereignty and to give up its freedoms, we would have to kick God out of all of our institutions. We would have to eliminate the Bible, Wayne. But that would never happen in America, would it? I mean, we were founded upon this. We were built upon this. It's th th this holds everything together. Well, we've kicked him out of government. We've kicked him out of our schools. We've kicked him out of our government buildings. We've kicked him out of society. We're trying to kick him out of our institutions of learning. We're kicking him out of our grade schools. We're kicking him out of our high schools. We, in effect, man, we, we've kicked God to the curb. And I said, secondly, we, we, we would have to change our constitution or at the least redefine it. Isn't that what we have done? Aren't we already in the process 
We, we even got this thing that we call the separation of church and state. That was never the original intent of our founding fathers. We were never, ever, ever intended to, to, to have this separation, to, to be able to kick God out. All it said was the government cannot enact a national religion. We're already doing it. We've already done it. Remember I told you a couple weeks ago, uh, on, I was watching the YouTube video, they were giving $1,000 away to anybody that could quote a Bible verse. They never gave away a dollar. They were just walking down the streets of I don't know what city. They walked down the street, they just asked, give me a Bible verse, give you $1,000. Bible verse, $1,000. Not one dollar was given away I'm telling you effectively they've already done it if we were going to have people give up their freedoms what would we need to do well we would need to destroy the traditional two parent family we would have to redefine family. That's the backbone of our society. Have we done that? We would need to sow seeds of division. Now, we, we've got this immigration problem, right? Coming into this country. We are no longer a melting pot for those that are entering into this country. We have become a nation of tribes. We are not, listen to me, we are not Anglo-Americans. We are not African-Americans. We are not Spanish-Americans. We are to, to, to mold together to become Americans. We're just Americans. Do you know that there are cities within cities in this country where Muslims are allowed to live by their own Sharia law? We're, we're, we're Americans. We should live by the laws of the land. Can I give you a scripture? A nation divided against itself, what? Shall not... Jeff, in order to give up our freedoms... We would have to disarm the citizens. Hmm. I think they call that gun control, right? I, I mean, is anybody else seeing anything here besides me? I'm talking about what would have to happen in order to make what's going to happen come to pass, you would have to disarm the citizenry and it's happening every day. What else, what, what else would have to happen? Let me, let, let, me, let me see here. Oh, I know what we'd have to do. We would have to change how we educate our kids and what we teach in the schools. We've abandoned the three R's and we now teach sex education, gender identity, and critical race theory. Wow. Do you know, this morning before I came, listen, I, I, I can't even write these fast enough. It, it's, the world's changing. 
in uh, some of the Catholic universities, uh, their traditional courses, no one is signing up for them. Uh, they are dropping, now get this, we're talking about Christian colleges, they are dropping their theology classes. I mean, why are you even a Christian school? They're dropping their theology classes for all these humanity courses, and guess what they're teaching? We've got to change the educational system. Then we would need to destroy our economy. Well, that means that you would need to spend more than you take in. I mean, this is, this is economics 101 right here. You got to bring in more than goes out. How do you think it's going to work around your house if payday or, or, or the, you know, your note comes due and, and you got more outgo than you got income? Doesn't work, does it? But the U.S. government, they just keep what? Spending. Guess what is going to happen? Collapse. Let me see. Let me, let me give you one or two more. See, th th this is not... This is not as far-fetched as it seems, is it? We would, I got two more. Two more that, that, that'll help this thing come to pass real quick. Number one, we would need to make people dependent on the government. Can I... Here, for you young people, Kevin, just so you understand this, going to Capitol. I, they're, they're not going to teach this at Capitol, okay? But I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to help your professor here. When the government uses the word free, it will cost you everything. And then thirdly, or, or lastly, I should say, thirdly, lastly, we would need to make this country interdependent on other countries. In other words, we would need to import more than we export. Oh. That's happening a billion times over, isn't it? Every policy, everything that we are doing, if you understand it through the lens of Scripture, we are destroying this nation to bring about a one-world government. Now, number three, I'll go quick here. What's going to have to happen? What's going to have to happen here? We need someone that is going to rise up and lead us. And let me tell you about this someone. Someone who's highly educated, an incredible communicator, and he's going to be wildly charismatic. Someone who has all, seemingly has all the answers to the problems that this world is facing. Now follow me here. We are told in Daniel chapter 7 verse 8 that this man likes to boast. In Daniel 7 25, he's not afraid to speak against the Most High. Daniel 7 25, he shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a times. That's three and a half years. 
Daniel 8, 23, a fierce king, a master of intrigue, and he will rise to power. 11, 21 of Daniel, he will come without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Daniel 11, 36, the king will do as he pleases, exalting himself and claiming to be greater than every god, even blaspheming the god of gods. He will succeed, but only until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined will surely take place. Daniel 11, 44, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. Daniel eleven thirty seven. 37, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he will exalt himself above them all. Uh, th that just tells me that he will probably be from a religious family and he will probably be a homosexual. 2 Thessalonians 2, he is a deceiver. That's, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 4, he will desecrate the temple. Revelation 13, he reigns over 10 kings. Revelation 13, 3, he receives a deadly wound of the head and is raised back to life. 13 and 5, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months, three and a half years. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. He will influence the entire world. And this is just some of what is said about the Antichrist. So, if this possessed man of Satan is going to rule globally then there has to be some form of global government. And this global government is the first leg of his three-legged throne. So how close are we? I mean, it ought to be... I mean, every single one of them. I mean, we're, 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 we're right there. It's happening. Closely aligned with this world government summit is the World Economic Forum, which met back in November. These are, this World Economic Forum is made up of the richest people in the world and supposedly the greatest minds that they can bring together. The leader of this group, I've shared this with you before, his name is Klaus Schwab. Now, Klaus Schwab, his dad... ran one of the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. They won't tell you that. And he's the leader of this group of elitists. And this November, when they met together, the title of his opening speech was, We Must Reconstruct the World. Others included Yuval Harari, George Soros, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and a long, long list of other globalists. Now, Harari, you need to remember this name. He is the consultant to Klaus Schwab and many of these other He was featured on 60 Minutes and he is openly advocating for a one world leader. And I was watching him on an interview that he gave. I'm quoting here. He said, fake news 
has been around a long time. That's how we got the Bible. After the World Economic Forum met, how many of you watch Ben Shapiro? Few? How about uh, Rand Paul? Anybody like Rand Paul? Ben Shapiro and Rand Paul both. I watched them both. And they both gave a warning about the Davos conference. Because a lot of people just laugh it off. They said, don't laugh this thing off. Don't laugh these people off. This thing is real. It's happening. Don't bury your head in the sand. I want to read to you one more paper, and then I'm going to quit. UN Forum Partnership was signed in a meeting held at the United Nations headquarters between uh, the Secretary General and World Economic Founder and Executive Chairman Klaus Schwab. They, they, they came into partnership together. to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, I, I don't know if you remember, I put that up there, what that 2030 uh, Agenda was. Uh, but here, the World Economic Forum and the United Nations signed today, now l listen how they were this, a strategic partnership framework, framework outlining, it, it, you hear what I'm saying? They're putting the framework together. They're outlining how to get this thing done. They're working on it. They're working on it. I'm going to leave you with this. I'm not worried about the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I'm telling you about what's going to happen. I, I, yes, we're going to be in the build up to this. We're going to be in the lead into it. We're going to, we're, we're, you know, things. Listen, I'm telling you, things can get bad. I don't know how far into this we have to go. But I'm telling you that what's going to trigger this whole thing, remember? I, I said, we, we got to go. We are God's restraining force. We are what is holding back the evil. You may think that there may not be many of us. Elijah just said the same thing and God said, oh no, I got way more than you know about. Uh, God's got way more than you know about. They are everywhere. There are good churches everywhere. Good pastors everywhere. Good people everywhere. And we are holding back the tide of darkness. But when we are taken out of the way, bam. I don't want to be around when that happens. First leg of his throne, global government. Nate, come and uh, play for us. You can stand to your feet. I used to milk cows. It's a little Dan, it was a little higher than this. And I definitely could not get down on this now. Do what? They're for what? Oh, toddlers milking cows. Yeah, you're probably right about that.
Christmas, I want to be in that number that's going out of here. I don't want to be around when these guys come to power. I know this is different, but you need to be aware of what's going on. Because it's happening. Channel 4, Channel 6, and Channel 10 is not going to tell you this stuff. Mainstream media, you're not going to hear it. They're all partnered up together. They're in on it. Do you know where your best source of information is? Bible. You stick with that Bible. You cannot go wrong. Stick with the Bible. Stick with the Bible. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, I did my best today. Lord, I, 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 I tried. Lord, I, I, want, I want to stand before God, but I don't want to just stand before God empty-handed. Lord, I want to bring all these. God, I, I want to tell people the truth. And God, I want to rejoice in eternity forever with the Frontline Church of God. Lord, I love your word, and I pray that we pay heed to the word of God. Lord, open our eyes to see truth. Open our ears to hear truth. And God, I pray that you would prepare yourself a people, a bride, without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. Lord, I pray that we stand before you and the only way we can is with clean hands and a pure heart. Lord, I pray that the things of this world would lose their hold on us to the degree that Jesus is the only thing that matters, that I am in a relationship with you. And Father, I pray right now there's somebody in here, they need the Lord. They need the Christ. Lord, I pray they make their decision today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you came today, maybe you haven't heard anything like this before. Listen, I want you to know, Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus Christ gave himself for you and he offers salvation and he offers a way of escape Christ and I want to ask you the question that we ask every week do you know Jesus is he your personal Lord and Savior you don't have to worry about Antichrist if you know Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Are you living for him? Today, if you would say, Pastor, I want to pray, and I want to get right with God, then I just invite you, just throw your hand up in the air. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to get right with God today. Maybe everyone is, I don't know. But I'm going to give you the opportunity today. Do you want to get right with God? Are you ready? Is your name written down in the land's book of life? When the trumpet sounds, are you ready to go out of here? Anyone at all? Amen. Bow your heads one more time. Father, Lord, trying times are going to come upon this earth. And I just pray that, uh, Lord, we as your people, 
Lord, would be prepared, ready, and walking, clothed in the armor of God, anointed with the Holy Ghost and fire. Lord, I pray we walk in the power of God. And Lord, however many days we have left, Lord, I pray that you would help us to make a difference. And Lord, help us to take back territory that the enemy has gained. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Everyone uh, say amen. amen. If you love the Lord, shout amen. Amen. amen.